What we should be seeing is chapter 12, uh, model tuning and the dangers of overfitting. Um, as we go through this particular presentation, I want to give thanks to uh, uh, Andy Farina. Uh, Andy uh, completed this particular slide deck in tiny modeling with our tidy modeling with our uh, cohort number one. Um, it has not changed. Um, I didn't use anything from the, the cohort number two, uh, but then Daniel Chen off, off also uh, from cohort three uh, gave this presentation. So I did watch both of their videos um, after reading the chapter. Um, it does set up for chapters 13 and 14 in the future. Um, so we are going to be talking about other features here, but uh, Frederica and Brandon, just know that I did not author this slide deck. I'm just going to present it as is. Um, it is uh, on our book club uh, GitHub repo, if anybody wants to check it out there as well. It, standing on the shoulders of giants as usual. That's exactly right? correct, yep. <laughs> well, but as I'm reading through the chapter, I'm like, I don't know if I'm confident, but I'm gonna go ahead and just watch somebody else and yeah, confirm, I, I, I think I know what we're talking about. So anyway, um, we'll see if there's any uh, oddities, that, the curveballs that I may uh, I may stumble through, we'll see. But There's some solace in watching the older videos too, where there is. Uh, people are like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's like, hey, you're not alone. Okay, I, I get yeah. this, that's good, that's good. Um, so the learning objectives for our chapter 12 is going to be recognizing examples of tuning parameters. We're going to uh, discuss the, uh, the function of tune uh, and also the dials package that we can uh, capture. I do have a couple of questions as we go into these later slides. So um, I'm hoping to put a couple of you on the spot and, and get some feedback in your own opinions of where this goes. Um, we are recognizing hyperparameters for machine learning models, recognizing tuning parameters for pre-processing uh, pre techniques. Uh, we have covered a couple of those in the previous chapters, uh, specifically the forest, uh, random forest model, et cetera. Recognizing structural parameters for class, uh, classic, uh, classical statistical models, recognizing examples of parameters that should not be tuned. And the, my favorite uh, example here is Bayesian. Uh, examples how different metrics can lead to different decisions about the choice of tuning parameter values. Explain how poor parameter estimates can lead to overfitting training models. There's some really awesome examples uh, that uh, Andy put in here. Um, they are not from the uh, uh, tiny, tidy modeling with our book. Um, they're actually Wikipedia examples, but the references are very, very uh, easy to comprehend. And then we also want to recognize strategies for optimizing tuning parameters. Uh, and this is comparing and contrasting the grid search and the iterative search, which will be chapters 13 and 14 uh, forthcoming. Um, we do use the tune package. There are uh, There is a couple of code snippets in here. Um, again, I'm going to be presenting this as I've ran the code. If I run into an error, I'll switch over to R and, and, and uh, repackage this. And then finally, uh, use the dials package for optimizing those tuning parameters. Um, there was a point during the cohort number one where Andy was giving the presentation and one of the other users uh, asked a question about workflow. There is a workflow package and uh, what John Harmon's response was is that think of these tuning parameters as being uh, very specific to a model. Whereas if you step back and you look at the larger spectrum of the entire tidy models framework, the workflow package is establishing the, the opportunity to uh, be specific with your model, if that makes sense, um, being able to, to work with it. I didn't spend too much time going down that rabbit hole, um, but I will uh, be able to answer any questions or maybe guide some users uh, on Slack if, uh, if anybody does have any questions about that. Okay, next slide. So what is a tuning parameter? Uh, we're defining exactly what this implies. It is an unknown structural or other kind of value that has significant impact on the model but cannot be directly estimated from the data. Um, I interpreted this sentence as being um, I'm familiar with the data set, but I don't want the data set to guide me in my assumption. Um, I don't know, I want the data to tell me uh, information that I'm prof uh, hypothesizing uh, and then confirming my, my theories. I don't want to be biased, but I don't want to use the biased word in, in the statistical model. Um, you've got to be careful as you're, you're managing information so that uh, you're not creating um, 
false assumptions, but again, I'm probably being too uh, vague or too naive with that comment. The uh, the fact that it's it's a it's a it cannot be directly estimated from the data itself. Uh, examples that we would include in machine learning uh, would be those hyperparameters. Uh, if you are going to use the boosting model, that's a, a number of boosting iterations, how many times you're going to boost it. Um, if you use a neural network, artificial neural network, uh, it would be the number of units or type of activation function. Um, the statement in the document uh, led to, uh, I believe it was nodes, uh, the number of nodes in a neural network. Um, that is a parameter that we as, as uh, uh, authors uh, can can uh, select from the modern gradient descent. Um, I was sharing an example with Brandon uh, or the team earlier um, how I relate to this particular uh, format, but it would be the learning rates, the momentous, and the iterations um, as you tune your model. Uh, how many times you're going to do that, and then finally with the random forest, it would be the number of predictors that you choose, the number of trees, and the number of data points. If we were to reflect on pre-processing, this would be your tuning parameters. Uh, for PCA, it would be the number of extracted components, or if you're uh, discussing uh, imputation, it would be uh, uh, nearest neighbors, K, uh, nearest neighbors, um, the number of neighbors that you select, um, how many groups that you create through your, uh, from your centroid. Um, the less you have, the more specific it is, but if you add more neighbors, then it can be just overtuned. Uh, and then finally, with statistical models uh, would be your structural parameters, and this is your binary regression, uh, both logistics, uh, probit and logit link, and then uh, longitudinal models. Uh, we're discussing the correlation and covariance structure of the data. I did have a question uh, at the first point here, and I'm just highlighting the word. Throughout the text, there were some references to links. Uh, and I associated those in documentation to being a family of the GLM. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the binary regression in general, both uh, logistic uh, regression uh, being a, a, a zero, one, true, false, uh, some kind of a binary relation, and how that sigmoid uh, is managed. So the, the comment about this link, does anybody know what that definition is? Or, or can you help define it for if I ask that question? Yeah, that's that's the uh, the log okay. function applied okay. to the odds. When you make a logistic regression, you okay. your respect um, your estimates. Yes. Okay. Are. Um, under um, a, a logistic form, okay. so it's a log of the odds, basically, and um, uh, you uh, the, the log link means that uh, when you make the formula, you mm -hmm. have uh, GLM. Now yep. we are not talking about uh, tidy models. Now let's say in I data, see. Okay. Okay. You you make GLM. And then you have the formula, which says uh, uh, the, the response variable and the predictors, the mm -hmm. data. And then you uh, um, mention the family, which That's is uh, uh, like family Poisson or, or uh, like binomial, for yes. example. Okay. And then uh, you have uh, uh, inside the binomial, the log, uh, the link function, which is the log, log gate function. And okay. this is the, just to say that you are using a transformation of the estimates, which are not just the average, the means okay. of the, the expected values, yep. but are under the form of logarithm uh, transformation. Okay. I didn't spend a lot of time, Frederica, yeah. in expanding into it. I did a couple of key searches and it wasn't exactly defining, but I, I, I find this example uh, occurring often within our documents, within the wealth of material that covers uh, R and, and, and just specifically uh, statistical modeling using R. We'll use a term and then we'll use that term over and over again, but we never quite define the term, if that makes sense. Um, the uh, If you remember uh, in, in, I think I was given a presentation for ggplot and they use the word 
Rob, and I've never heard that term before. Uh, it just kind of popped up in the middle of the text and it was implied that the user mm -hmm. understood what that meant. After researching that term uh, further, it made more comprehension of why that term was used. But um, maybe it's, it's, it could be my own understanding as well. And I'll, I'll do some more research. Your statement does run in line with all the media that I did read yeah. in this case. Yeah. So. I, I had the same the same thinking. Um, I I thought that was redundant in some 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 somehow because it's like, right. but it is then then I thought it it is like a specification of the family. Mm -hmm. So there may be possible to use different transformations which are different from the log. Right. And so, but it defined uh, it is defined as the log link uh, log link function. Okay. So it's uh, the log, which is the link uh, in, within your estimates in your model. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. There are. Uh, Good explanation. Thank you. It is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the next slide, it talks about uh, what not to tune or when not to tune. Um, we don't want to tune prior distributions of Bayesian. And the purpose there is. is uh, Bayesian has a different uh, format of assumption, or not assumption, uh, format of process. And so by uh, uh, potentially tuning your priors, you're not really doing anything specific. John had a good uh, comment about what this implies uh, in uh, cohort number one. And then uh, finally, the uh, number of trees in random forest and bagging. Um, it does not need tuning. Instead, it focuses on the stability. And the reference uh, in the last video with this relation and going back to, I believe it was last week's uh, uh, chapter 11. Frederick, is, was that correct? Did we do forest last week? There was one video or one, one presentation that I caught halfway through. Um, I think we've used random forest Multiple the last times. couple of weeks, okay. yeah, kind of as a comparison to some of the other methods. Okay, because each of the each of the trees is. Uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, <laughs> but it's 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 some sort of it's like the resampling method and everything is part of it. Um, yes, but and this that that exact code snippet will come out here in a moment, Brandon. I think you're you're stating it correctly. What the reference I interpreted what. Uh, in reading and, and watching the videos was if we used 10, 100, 1,000, or 10,000, right? It doesn't really matter. You just are throwing a number out there. How many times do you want to branch this or how intricate, how 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 many branches you create, I think is the, the definition that we're referencing here. Um, so the uh, uh, comment of not tuning uh, or, or not required to tune is it doesn't need tuning. Instead, it focuses on the stability. If you change or, or fragment your random forest, um, you're just branching it even more and more and more. Uh, there's a point of, uh, it's, it's like the, uh, uh, what's that uh, called? Not point of no return. It's the um, it's where you don't improve anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah it's the bond it's of log diminishing returns. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. just you, you get too specific to now you're just dealing with precision. It's still the same number. Um, you're just adding more decimal uh, points or precision at the end. Yeah. yeah. Um, next slide. So here's where things started to make sense in both the reading and also watching the past presentations. And what we're dealing with is obviously the Ames uh, data set, but we're creating, uh, using the package model data, um, creating or uh, mutating through uh, base or log 10 uh, for sales price, uh, sale price. And then setting the seed at 63, uh, we split, um, with a, uh, we split our testing and training model. Um, and then the stratification is the central error. This is actually what's funny because it's a, a binomial, it's either a yes or a no. Uh, does the house have central error or does it not? So when you split across this and then um, you uh, uh, create your, your uh, graph, uh, the comment was red is that it does not have central error. And then yes, it does have central error. What's important here is in a moment, we're going to see that the model didn't really do very well in the first initial run. Um, let me slide to the next, uh, let me move to the next slide. And I think we come back to this, we'll see this uh, model again. 
Those are two really unbalanced classes too. That's There's... one of the comments. Yep. They said that it's, it's really noisy and, and didn't really predict very well or, or the presentation. Um, the comment was there's a lot of uh, hits in this 1950 column. Um, okay. Previously, when Andy was given this presentation, he commented, wasn't really sure why that occurred. And it just kind of hit into that 1950 wall uh, and just kind of all propagated right there. Uh, what metrics should we use? So this is a decision, right? This is where we start to get into the, to the rock conversation, et cetera. If you look at the three types, the logit, the probit, or the, the log log, uh, complementary log log, the, uh, uh, the choice that we're making is the better of the values or the higher of the values. So in this case, it would be the negative 380 or positive 380, however you want to read it. Um, for the log it being the better of the choices. Um, if we just uh, look at the log likely, likelihood statistic, the logistic link function appears to be statistically significantly better than the probit and complementary log functions. However, if we use the area under the rock curve, um, by the way, I'm being specific here, so I wrote this down to make sure I specified, uh, rock is receiver operating characteristic curve. Um, I'm really big about not using a lot of acronyms that I'm unfamiliar with, so I always try to specify what they are. Um, we see that there's no significant difference between the three link functions. However, when we uh, plot the three link functions, we also see that there's no uh, substantially uh, different in predicting whether a house has central air. The focus that they have within this uh, point, and I can zoom in slightly to make it easier. I don't want to get the focus on that graph at the bottom just yet. I don't do that. Uh, plus, sorry, I'm just wanting us to give focus on this one uh, graph first. The reference that we're having is the difference between the probit, the logistic, and the log log. And then if we look at it on the second uh, with the rock curve, um, and you look at the decimal points here, there really isn't much difference. They're all almost equal. So now if we go back and plot all three of them, we see this uh, downward, uh, 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 downward path, uh, each one of them being the dotted lines, the straight lines, and the dashed lines. Okay. That's representing all three of those models. So again, it's representing the fact that all three of them are kind of almost the same. Okay. But if you were to choose between these three, based on this statistical uh, path, you would want to use the log it as the more appropriate. Okay, next slide. Any How do you questions? interpret that line? Do you, do you if it's this, above it, it's yes, and if it's below it, it's no? Like I, I think what we're seeing here, Brandon, is just the plotting of those uh, predictions. Uh, so using all three of the models and then uh, pasting them on the, on the graph. Um, if you don't mind, I can switch over to the R code and we can analyze this if you'd like. Well, I don't want to distract too much, but it was okay. just a curiosity of mine. Yeah, go, go ahead. Keep, uh, keep going, Ryan. It's okay. all right. Uh, all right. Uh, let's zoom back out. Okay, so these are the three uh, points or the graphs that I was referring to. Um, I think this was a, a really good representation of uh, us as authors, these uh, building these data models uh, or, or creating our anal uh, analysis. Uh, this is a really good point to reference. Um, overfitting is always a concern as we start to tune hyperparameters. If you get too uh, specific, you're going to overfit and then that's not going to give you any, any uh, uh, good data either. Um, it's a good balancing act. So the tip from the book is using out of sample data is the solution for detecting when a model is overemphasizing the training set. So what we're what we're reflecting here, and this is a this is not from our text. This is a Wikipedia link, uh, and the the link is in the source code. But if we're using overfit or underfitting, right? We're not tuning properly. Um, I won't say the word greedy. It's just you're not taking into account all of the variance within the data set. Uh, so by plotting it and then just drawing a line, we're underfitting. Brandon, I think this is what's going on with that representation above. We haven't done any tuning yet, so therefore it didn't plot properly, or it's it's just uh, drawing the the just a straight line, just the straight line, and that's it. Um, if the desired function though is 
we're going to tune the parameters so that it, it gives good reflection of what the predicted model would be. Uh, and so again, this, this uh, curve kind of following the plotted data, um, or if we're using uh, some form of a, uh, a difference here, a grouping method, um, we're, we're separating the two, uh, even though we have an outlier, that's okay. It still uh, fit the desired output that we're looking for. The point that we have to be careful for is when we overfit and overfitting is you're not even really creating any statistics. It's like perfect because it fits every data point. Um, and this is always something that you want to pause and, and give reflection on. Uh, have I overfit the model? Do I need to go back and, and do a little bit more tuning or uh, analysis? Uh, Frederick or Steve, Brandon, do you want to add any comment to this graph? Um, don't, but, uh, I, I like to say that uh, maybe the, the, the line would be uh, so like this um, design um, fitting um, yes. in, in case we have this partition within uh, yes or not uh, you find that uh, on uh, above the line you have some uh, like the yes is uh, so a part of the data and below the, the line you have the other uh, so basically that, that would be a partition line to for you to uh, to see um, what is the the major part of the the data that would be um, referring to this yeses or not this know. this desired at the bottom here Frederick is what you're yeah referring for example, to okay yeah yes and the, the the overfitting piece is that we're creating this this uh, uh, not precision we're we're creating a model that takes into account every single one of them and so you get this really kind of uh, screwbally line that's grouping and keeping all of the the points together um, that's definitely overfitting it does not fit in the just if if the red lines weren't there and you were just looking at it your eye could could kind of group this together um, without your eye looking at the data can figure out if it fits or if it's overfitting. Um, if it gets too crazy skewed, um, especially in an in a output, um, let me get to the next slide and I think it'll it'll answer my yeah, statement a no, little better. I, I, like, uh, I like to say that, that that would be, that looks fantastic, you know, because you catch all the points correctly as you want. But then with new data, you might have problems because the, the line will keep doing its way, which yes. most probably doesn't uh, catch the, the new points, basically. So you have overfitted, it seem, seems perfect, but it, in, in reality, it is not. Good point, good point. Um, make sure that I'm not catching. Yeah, there's your, it's it's the boot camp. Uh, the R boot camp is the uh, site where he brought those in from. So these next three plots, there was a comment in past uh, delivery uh, where somebody joked that these were potentially Python plots. And uh, being that it's an R book club, uh, everyone kind of had a good laugh about that. Um, they're actually from Wikipedia. Um, we weren't exactly clear on, or the previous members weren't exactly clear on what uh, language uh, produced these graphics. Uh, but it does do a really good job uh, relating to the various types where you're talking about a grid search, a random search, and an iterative search. So the way you want to interpret this graph is the green tick marks across the bottom of or across the top of your x coordinates and then the, the uh, green tick marks on the y coordinates. What was explained in this, and I believe it'll be in future chapters uh, uh, 13 and 14, is <clears throat> how exactly these are applied. So you're, you're, you're filling a matrix of data points, and then from that matrix, uh, grouping uh, exactly where the model uh, lies. I'm being vague here because I haven't done this code, so I'm not quite familiar, nor have I read that chapter. I think it's just staging for a future presentation uh, that will explain exactly what's going on. If we go to the random search, it makes it a little bit easier to comprehend what's going on uh, as a comparison between grid search being very coordinated. Uh, the random search, you notice the tick marks are uh, 
very much grouped together or they're not uh, spaced perfectly out. Uh, and then all of your um, data points uh, are kind of scattered across this, uh, this search. Uh, and then the third model is going to be this iterative search and the comment from the uh, past uh, users and in the text as well. The iterative search is probably, I'm not saying it's the best point, every use case has to, has to be determined, but uh, just looking at the way this was presented, the iterative search kind of groups these together. And so you can see how the, the tick marks are all um, as, it, as it creates your prediction, uh, they all kind of tune to the, to the center points um, within here. Uh, any comments? Again, I'm being very vague with this presentation. I didn't create these, I'm only representing them. Okay. It, the iterative looks a little bit like gradient descent. I'm sure it's a different thing, but yeah, just the and fact I, that it kind of stays in the neighborhood. Well, and Steve, I think that's that gradient descent thought process. Um, in my in my mind, the way I'm I'm associating to gradient descent is like um, the amplitude of a sine wave, and then as you become uh, closer and closer to zero. Uh, you'll never actually reach that point or, or you'll never be perfect, but it'll get as close to it as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. And then my further comment to Brandon was that, you know, uh, at, at some point, it's a law of diminishing returns. You can you can add as much as you want, but you're not really getting much change. You're just increasing the precision into infinity. Mm -hmm. The gradient descent concept is where the sine wave just slowly starts to get almost to, to a point of no modulation at all, no amplitude mm -hmm. at all. So... And uh, the, the number of times or the number of iterations before you get to that point, that is where we get our grouping. I think you're correct, 100% correct with that comment. Okay. Um, section 12.7 is tuning parameters in tidy models using the dials package. So in Parsnip uh, for model specification, we can use the main arguments Rand Forest and engine specific called Ranger. Uh, for a good starting points uh, in the tidy models website, we have the reference docs and that takes us out to a tidy models reference and then the searchable table. Um, I'm going to go ahead and select this link because I found the past presentation very rewarding. Uh, this did kind of help comprehend what we're dealing with in, in reference to using these tuning parameters. So if you don't mind, I'm going to select that. And what, what helps in relation is the actual model itself, uh, model type, package mode, and engine. And these are searchable. Uh, so if you're looking for something very specific, the exploratory models, and then at the bottom uh, are the arguments in relation to them. Uh, where I found this uh, most specific or, or my comprehension level uh, is if you were to look in the help menu uh, of some of these packages uh, and you're searching for a particular term and then you get a huge help menu of all these various options and you're like, now I've got more search terms I got to look for. Um, going back out and, and, and taking it to this particular website, this searchable website, um, we're now getting a little bit more finite detail or, or a little bit more reference, uh, easier consumption of that reference um, than just help menus. Now, let me get back to my, let's just get that out of the way for a second. All right, now my computer is somehow frozen. Oh, I know, sorry. I did that for a reason uh, because I, I didn't open up the link in a new tab. Uh, I had to go back uh, to the uh, presentation itself. And again, uh, as, a, as a reinforcement to both of these and this presentation in general, it is all in the book club. If you need that link or if you haven't visited the uh, GitHub repo for Chapter 12, um, if you scroll down and look for Markdown hyperlinks, um, you'll see both of these options uh, to uh, navigate with. So here we're going to build a recipe. Uh, we're gonna start uh, using these tuning parameters. Um, Frederica, to your, your benefit of the comment you made about the link earlier, um, we're gonna see that come out here in just a moment. Um, so I'll hopefully try to make an association to what's going on there. 
If we're looking at the recipe, we're adding the sales price as our uh, dependent and then neighborhood, uh, uh, GR live area, uh, year remodeled building type um, as being our independence. And then again, the data set is the AIMS training data, which we created earlier. Okay. So using a random forest model, excuse me, I didn't want to do that. Using a random forest model, <clears throat> we're going to set the engine to Ranger. Now this Ranger package is something to take note of. Uh, it's very specific in being able to assist in tuning some of our parameters. And we're going to see examples of what we're doing here. And we're going to set the, mo mo uh, the mode to regression. The uh, main arguments, uh, if you were to do an ARGS uh, uh, request, is random forest. Uh, and what you're going to get is the three points, the mode, the engine, the mtri, and then the tree's value itself. These are all potential tuning parameters, or we'll see here in a moment when we, when we run this, um, it'll give you some options of what is or isn't uh, specific. Uh, if we look at engine specific arguments, again, we can call on that Ranger uh, package. Um, and if you were to run this, it's going to open up a help menu with a whole bunch of additional options. Okay. Um, so now by adding the tuning parameters, we're going to uh, continue with this random forest concept. Uh, but now we're going to replace the mtri with tune. We're going to replace trees with 2000 and the min n as tune. We also set the uh, uh, engine tuning uh, ability, regular uh, regularization factor. Uh, and Andy had made a comment that he's just naming it reg. Um, otherwise, it's going to spit out this regularization factor as a naming convention. Uh, and then set model regression. Nothing has changed other than we're replacing some of our variables with tune. The tune value returns an expression. Uh, these tags are parameters for optimization within the tiny tidy models framework. So we run a parameters RF spec tuned, and it's going to give us a question mark or a plus symbol. This is important. And the relation that I'm hoping to, to uh, reiterate here uh, from the past author's slide deck, if we were to go back and look at the previous slide, and we're looking at these three points, Okay, and then we go forward and show these parameters that we have options for tuning on. It's the question mark and the plus symbols. The statement was the plus symbols are locked in. Don't worry about them. It's already been tuned. The question mark is something that you as a user have to uh, specify. But we'll see that we can also tune that as well. Op uh, automatically tune it uh, in a moment. Okay. So the randomly selected predictors are the mtri. Um, if you need, uh, this is an output, but it says you can look at finalize, update parameters, or uh, for more information. The notation n, uh, n parameter plus indicates a complete numeric parameter. n parameter question mark indicates a missing value that needs to be addressed. So by running this parameters uh, spec tuned and getting an output, it's an indication to you as an author these are going to be handled by the code. Um, here's an option that you want to go research a little bit further. Does that make sense? And I don't think in, in the past viewing of our cohort or in, uh, reading the document, I don't remember ever seeing this previously. So I think this is a, uh, entered in, into the tuning pair, uh, chapter, and then we'll probably see it going forward into the future. So the M try, so I'm just sorry, I'm, I'm looking okay. at the docs a little bit too. M try says it's an integer for the number of predictors that will be randomly sampled at each split when creating the model. Yes, sir. So the reason it's a question mark is- We don't because know what it doesn't. There's sorry. no way for the system to automatically select that. So we as the author are going to, to uh, I don't want to use the word seed, that's the wrong term to use, but, um, we're going to try it, and then you can do an update. Uh, we're going to see here in a moment oh, okay. uh, when we run a when we run a parameters update command. This yeah. will change to being uh, automatically applied. Um, but whereas, like min n and the regularization factor, those are it's clear to the model what it needs to do. There, so um, I didn't spend a lot of time analyzing this particular code, Brandon. So I want to okay. be careful. I'm going to sound extremely naive in my response. Sure. 
in my interpretation of what was stated previously or how these uh, parameters are used, when I use the term automatic, I'm saying that the package itself is uh, uh, viewing the data frame or the, the uh, testing and training model that we created. We're giving it this information and then based on the data we're providing it, it's automatically um, setting these variables uh, from the package itself. It's not something we have to arbitrarily give it uh, to start this whole sequence. Right. Um, the term automatic in my vocabulary is implying that the computer is taking care of the hard labor for us. We don't have to, uh, we don't have to enter a value and then iterate over, you know, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times to, to figure out which is the most optimal. The uh, computer already does that for us. Okay. And I think we're going to see here in a second where we get the updated uh, point. If not, I'll try to find the code point where that is stated. Um, so updating tuning parameters. To see what we need to update or finalize, we can uh, call the function the, uh, from the dials package. So we, we call the mtry, and it says the random selected predictors uh, in a quantitative mode would be one and question mark. Again, because we don't know. We don't know what that value is going to be yet. Uh, we can also use the dials package to see the tuning range. So if we do uh, uh, minimum n, uh, we're going to see that it's set at 2 and 40. And then uh, to update and finalize uh, or adjust the high parameters, we could use the update function to update in place. So we pass parameters with that spec tuned um, over to the update function with the mtry, and then we're giving it a 1 and a 4. By specifying that value that was a question mark earlier, we're now setting it as one and four, and then we run uh, after the update uh, is complete, you're gonna see that now it's gonna have a value entered for that. So at this point, that comment I was making about everything being automatic and then the code ends up saying, I don't know what to do here. Uh, user, please give me a variable, something to start with. And going in and, and running that update command with entering one and four, uh, and then doing the update command the output says, okay, now I've got the information I require. Now I can continue processing. I hope I'm stating this correctly. And if anybody into the future watching this video and me presenting uh, want to correct me, please feel welcome. I am more than happy to receive any critique from any user. So uh, we can see that now mtry is complete uh, with that numeric parameter. All right, uh, so finalizing our tuning parameters to update the function may not be useful if a recipe is attached to a workflow that adjusts the number of columns. At this point during the past presentation is when the previous group broke off and we they were talking about the workflows package as a whole. Um, earlier uh, within our presentation, I made a reference to this comment. Um, there is a new package or the way you want to view workflows, it's kind of stepping back even further uh, from tuning parameters and just looking at it at a more holistic or global view. Uh, instead, we can use update, we can final, uh, we can use the finalize function. So update parameters uh, with the workflow, passing over to random forest tuned or add model uh, over to the recipe, which we created earlier with our dependent and independent variables. Um, and then using the parameters function for finalize, uh, this is kind of like locking in the variables. With the finalize function, mtry was complete based on the number of predictors in the training data set. And then we can view updated parameters to pull the dials object okay, for mtry. And we see that it's now updated to uh, show one in 74. Okay, pause for a second, because this is important. And there was not a direct answer of why this was happening. Um, and I haven't uh, found any other comment uh, during this period of time in the uh, past. But the question was, why did it change to 74? If we entered four initially, why did it update and now showing the range change to one in 74? Is and that every parameter? Yeah, that or the was, 74 predictors, I guess, would be the that question. Was the, yeah, that was the comment from the, the team was, um, the statement was, well, didn't you use a, a, a dot uh, in, in your recipe, meaning that you're pulling in the whole data set? And the comment was, no, the recipe was specific. We only had the dependent and then three uh, or three or four independent variables. Um, why all of a sudden is it looking across the entire data set? 
Hmm. Uh, there wasn't a direct answer to why this is happening. So um, if any of the team wants to go in and, and research, hmm. uh, I'd be okay. more than happy yeah. to critique this. Um, I found it as a curiosity myself um, and, and intend on uh, spending some time comprehending what's going on. Does it uh, mean Steve, it's going to ignore your model and <laughs> try figure out its own model? Only three. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I think I think to Steve's benefit, uh, his his earlier statement was there's 74 variables in this data set. I think that is a correct statement, Steve. Um, oh, regardless okay. of what we initially told it to look for, it's going to look across the whole data set as a whole. That's I believe wild. that's how this is this is happening. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Although that's wasteful if your model only takes into account so. three or four variables. <laughs> well, I was thinking the, the the larger data sets, right? When I say large, that's a that's a uh, billions a, of uh, rows. Yeah, it, it could be an infinite number of of uh, variables that we have in uh, a data set. Uh, this could be very taxing to a computer. Uh, sure. Should you try to process uh, without uh, uh, specifically telling it these are the terms I want to use? Yeah, so, so have to get one of those Cloud Mac <laughs> Cloud bill coming in. Oh no. Yep. <laughs> yeah, get a cluster. You spent ten thousand dollars with flops processing Whoops. this media. No, I'm kidding. Um, we have to know the price of a house in Ames. <laughs> right. Right. Um, from this point, team, the uh, uh, this is the last comment within this presentation, and I'm only um, I guess forty five minutes into our presentation. We got a few minutes left to discuss, but uh, this is the last slide, and it says, "What do you do next?" Um, the parameters object must be explored, uh, knows the range of parameters, the dials package contains a number uh, of the grid uh, functions that take the parameter object as input and produce different types of grids. Um, chapter 13, uh, we'll explore this comment further, and that is the next topic, if I can switch over here real quick. Um, grid search and iterative search are going to be the next two chapters that will expand on this particular topic further. Um, I don't know if I successfully conveyed chapter 12 to the depth that was required and setting us up for success for chapters 13 and 14. Um, my earlier comment was giving thanks to Andy for putting this presentation together. Um, as I read through the chapter and as I uh, watched the uh, two previous cohorts videos uh, concerning this particular chapter, everybody repeated the same thing. Um, the one oddity in this statement uh, was uh, cohort number two. Um, during this chapter, they did not use anything in the book at all. Uh, in fact, the uh, presentation is talking about a completely different subject altogether. Um, there may be some relation to hypertuning and, and being able to uh, uh, better model, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't finish watching the whole video. I scrolled through very, very quickly through it. Um, does anybody have any questions or any details as you were reading this that you want to expand on? Well, I think uh, it's a... Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Frederica. Um, uh, I'll just say that um, it's, it's now a bit more clear than before because I uh, like to... Th this is the, the core of tidy models because you know, you use this syntax that uh, it's more verbose, but for, for tuning uh, your models appropriately and making changes while you starting with a model and then you make another model, then you tune in differently, you make a grid. So this, this is a very important part of the book. And uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I think you did a good job and uh, uh, I think this is not uh, as uh, straightforward as it seems, or my, it doesn't seem, but um, you, think you just need to tune the parameters and say tune, or maybe add some uh, numbers uh, as you prefer and everything. But uh, it, it, that, that's much more behind it because you need to understand why exactly you use that that tune parameter more than another. So I think if, what, if we go forward with the other chapter, then at the end we have like a, a picture, uh, a bit more clear uh, what we can do with study models. 
I definitely felt out of my comfort zone. And I, I, I did pause during the uh, review of media or preparation for today. I've spent most of the week not stressing over it. Um, Steve, if, if you recall last week, um, and, and I had pinged and said, hey, uh, you were scheduled to do chapter 12. Do you want me to, uh, I didn't want to jump ahead of you or anything of that nature. The, uh, as, I, as I reflected on the media, I learned a lot in academia of how to do some of these tasks. But again, using it and, and I would never, never at this point in time with my, with my uh, uh, current use of R, I would never uh, say that I would be able to replicate any of this. Uh, going back and reviewing the, uh, the media itself, even both in the, the book itself and also in our, uh, in our past cohorts, staring at it, I'm still at a, at a pause point where I don't know if I could successfully create that code by myself with the entire workflow of, of data analysis in general. Um, what I do uh, find in, go ahead. Ahead. sorry, sir. Sorry. Oh, I get, I guess um, I hear what you're saying. I, yep. I'm wondering if it would be helpful to, um, although maybe this is like a, a lot of, uh, you know, looking around as well, uh, yeah, yeah. looking at some of Julia Silge's uh, videos because she, yeah, she's done, she's done so many videos. I, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably one that, that will maybe go into this topic. So maybe that's kind of a good follow up item. There was. To, uh, and then maybe that'll be more concrete and, and yeah, it'll, it'll click. I think when I was, uh, when I was off searching for that link comment, uh, the, uh, the uh, relationship that I asked earlier, um, Ju one of Julia Silge's uh, videos came up. She was discussing this topic. Um, mm. What I what I do want to, um, if I can be uh, as specific as possible, um, repeat uh, a comment she made was that out of all of the books that she's authored or or assisted in authoring, the tidy modeling with R is probably the least uh, uh, not clean. That's the wrong word to use. It's it's the least um, finished. It's, it's still kind of in a working progress. And there is going to be a, an update and a release to this book. There was a, a, a news post uh, or a, a uh, message thread uh, that was posted saying that the uh, book is going to be released coming up soon. Um, it was actually from oh, that, yeah. Ms. Silge. She, she made a comment that she spent the weekend uh, uh, authoring and uh, it was a rewarding weekend and that she's preparing to release the next iteration of the document. The reference or the importance to that statement is that it is changing. So this particular chapter will probably get flushed out a little bit more. Um, again, in, in my own interpretation, and this is very opinionated, but in my own iter uh, my, my own review of chapter 12, uh, there were points where I'm like, I don't know if this is important. I, you're, you're, you're making a reference, but I'm not clear on what this reference is telling me. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll just here, if you don't mind, if I'm going to be uh, sure. potentially uh, get my, my own self in trouble. There were some points uh, in some of these references where they were making comments to citation um, for future, you know, for, for more reading, you know, go check this other citation out. And mm -hmm. what I found early on, I think this was on Saturday, maybe Sunday uh, last week, what I found is that it took me down this rabbit hole of, wow, I, I don't know really what we're trying to state here. Um, I get the concepts, but I'm not, I'm unable to associate what the reading is telling me in relation to doing this tuning parameter concept. Um, the uh, more specific, uh, where was the, there was a comment, it wasn't Bayesian. Mm -hmm. There was one reference that I went off on a on a on a tangent with and spent almost an hour reading about it, and I just came to the conclusion that I don't know what I'm doing here, uh, or I'm not I'm not making the association. Mm. But, um, maybe it's this Thomas and Yuminsky 2020. No, it's earlier than that. It was like a 1970s reference uh, uh, book. I, maybe it was optimization. Ah. It's this one, the Nelder Mead simplex like, method, method, Olson and Nelson, 1975. Mm. Uh, this was a fascinating read. 
uh, but the association or reference or citation to this, um, other than it being called out in the text of the book, um, I was failing to comprehend the association of what we were trying to state in this paragraph. I guess that that was my example of um, where this uh, became very overwhelming, the uh, sheer volume of information of trying to convey what's going on with this chapter. So if you can step back and just realize that chapter 12 is staging and setting us up for success in chapters 13 and 14 with the grid search and the iterative search, um, it makes a little bit more sense. And an introduction to the tuning model that Frederica mentioned, um, being able to, to use it um, or, or apply it um, is going to make the choice or the identity, the predicting of your model uh, easier and simpler, especially within tidy models. Okay. Yeah, cool. I, I do yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. I do remember them saying um, that this was still very much a work in progress, and even just a month ago, they had made major ch changes. Mm -hmm. Like, because uh, I remember, what wasn't chapter twelve like chapter eleven previously, or something like that? And they shifted everything down and created a new chapter later. And there's, so, there's yeah, work in progress. Shuffling, yeah. I, I feel like I was a little uh, disoriented when I did a, a presentation a couple weeks ago. I was looking, and depending where I looked, uh, the chaptering was different. Yeah, as you say, stuff like that. So I kind of just had to get get a handle on that. Um, but yeah, work in progress, I guess. I suspect that these sessions um, and these cohorts have been very, very useful to them mm -hmm. writing the book. Because you know, you you can yeah. point out things like this doesn't make sense in the context of this chapter anymore. And maybe they can spend the time to explain that. I don't know where, I guess you'd put that, put a GitHub, you know, issue. A pull request to it or yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, not a pull request, but an issue mm -hmm. to say, I don't know what this is for. And <laughs> maybe yeah. they'll fix it. Well, I think, it that's, I think that's a legit use of, of the whole issue thing. I, yeah. I, they probably They probably have a convention for it where you tag it a certain way or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know it's an advanced topic, and that's the other other comment is is yeah. I, I I'm doing instructional design, e learning training, et cetera. And one mm -hmm. of the the key points is you know your user base, right? Uh, uh, being aware or being able to to analyze the user base that's consuming your media. Um, you if if you're if you're not aware of the topic, but yet you're judging it. To say that I can't understand it, well, it may just be to an advanced topic for your your level of, of comprehension at the moment. Um, That's it, yeah. So the 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 uh, Frederica and I have been on a couple of, of shared book clubs, and one of the statements was the uh, Mr. Harmon had made a statement that there's like this halfway point, this predictive model halfway point hmm. uh, between the R for DS book and the tidy modeling book. There's this middle of the road. Uh, comprehension level that hasn't been established uh, or we don't have a book yeah, for it yeah, yeah interesting Frederica, do you know that link that i'm referring to or do you have that mm, no i need to look at it I, it was a it's a, i think it's a spencer book and it's i think it's predictive models uh i don't know if mr Kewen is authoring it or he's a co-author with the book but it is a halfway point between your comprehension of using R as a language and, and statistical modeling, mm -hmm. and then getting into tidy models where now you're in this uh, specific package of, of accessing all this media. Uh, mm -hmm. There isn't really a point where you're uh, associating to what these various models do um, or the, the uh, choice of which model to, to uh, access. Yeah, sometimes look at all the different kind of models uh, mm -hmm. can be a little scary. So right. it takes a, a bit of time to understand all of them, but uh, uh, it depends what you do. If you, if you like to understand these things, you grab a book uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> about modeling and there's a couple of uh, citations, um, I think at the beginning of the book, uh, and they mention it. They uh, and, and look at, at those books, and then made this as a practical, more practical uh, um, utility uh, feature to use. And uh, so, yes, it might be a little scary because, especially when when next in the 
uh, in the next chapters, when we reach the 15, chapter 15, screening many uh, models, then you'll see that they try like six, seven models within one workflow. Uh, mm -hmm. And you don't, you might don't understand, you, you don't know them maybe, and that can be possible if you, for example, in epidemiology, you just use a couple of models, linear models and logistic models. Uh, you might use ANOVA, you might use, so just a few things. And here is the world of modeling. You know, you have the, the, the dimensions or the variety of the models. So yeah, if you want to get inside, understand very well, you need to have a look at uh, different type of models, how they works and all the other things. I just want to know enough to be dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> That's an awesome comment. Um, Frederick, I'm all finished. Um, I'll stop presenting if that's okay. That's okay. There we are. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Ryan. Yes, thanks so much. Very good. You, I appreciate you did so much uh, background work on that, checking out the I, previous yeah. cohorts and everything. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, not a problem at all. Okay, so see you all next week uh, with Steve presenting. I think I'm signed uh, up. Yeah, so, I'll try to put together yeah. something nice <laughs> in this, between now and then. All right. Okay. Looking forward okay. to you. Thank you. Okay. See you then. Weekend, everyone. Have a nice rest of the day. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.